Mark, um, when you asked me to, to introduce uh, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond, it was a moment of me to try to reflect and think, what could I say um, about her um, that breaks through the bio you have on your website or what people know? People know um, about leading not only the transition team for the Biden administration education, but also the Obama education uh, transition team. Um, I remember being a young grad student um, in DC when Linda Darling Hammond gave um, the Brown lecture for AERA. I got a front row seat. I was in there two hours early. I don't know very many educationalists who bring an audience to tears and then to their feet. Lily, of course, yourself. But I mean, um, Linda, I was also thinking about the time that she and I were together in Singapore. And you know, we were there actually with uh, with the, the Obama's education secretary team and people like that. And Arnie was asking the Minister of Education of Singapore, so what's your secret for having such a fantastic education system here? And he pointed at Linda. She wrote our plan. She helped us think through what to do. In fact, if you go to high performing education systems anywhere in the world, the chances are more likely to see citations of Linda's work than almost any other researcher on the planet. She, we've also been working for years on the International Summit to the Teaching Profession. Um, it's almost inconceivable of someone that's had a more direct impact on education thinking on the profession, both nationally and globally, um, and someone who's more humble in terms of, of that impact. I, I love the fact that she also refuses to accept the notion that teaching could be thought of as charity. And she, she fights back very strong in terms of, of a vision of the profession um, and, and what the pre profession needs in terms of getting that support unapologetically, but with research and evidence, um, teaching in America's future. I mean, was the seminal report in terms of a lot of, of really the important teacher policy uh, movement that came after that. I can list the whole alphabet soup, Mark. I can list NCATE and AACTE and AERA and, and all of those. And, but I would put EI with that. I would put UNESCO with that. So um, I just think that uh, we are so well served having um, Linda Darling Hammond thinking and leadership in terms of this transition at this moment for the United States, for California, but for the world. So without further ado, Mark, I very much uh, congratulate you for bringing our dear friend and the brilliant Linda Darling Hammond to this International Education Day and giving me the, the honor of getting to introduce her. Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much, David. And welcome, welcome, Linda. And we're gonna exit and we're gonna come back and ask you some questions in a little bit. Thank you again. Well, thank you. I'm glad I had my video off so that I you couldn't see me blushing while David was giving that introduction. I should really stop while I'm ahead, but thank you so much, David. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here with um, everyone who is uh, really trying to figure out how to strengthen our education systems all around the world, in Minnesota, in the United States, and well beyond. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen for a few minutes to talk a little bit about this issue of how do we really rethink and restart uh, education in ways that build back better. Um, some of you will recognize that as the um, uh, Biden um, theme and it is what we've been working on in the transition. I will say two things about the transition uh, that every transition team for this president has worked with a high sense, sense of urgency uh, around two things. One is, of course, dealing with the pandemic, uh, getting uh, everyone to a place where we are safe, where we are able to move forward in terms of um, public health, in terms of you know, our personal safety, but also to reopen schools in safe ways so that children have the benefit of all that their teachers can bring them. And the other pillar for the transition has been the pillar of racial equity and equity in all forms. And when we think about restarting and reinventing schools uh, for equitable learning, for empowering learning, uh, we wanna build on 
some of the most important work that's gone on in the world that David already mentioned, uh, and that um, you know uh, many of you have been a part of uh, doing as you innovate, as you share ideas, uh, and as we uh, really have an opportunity to use the disruption to rethink <clears throat> the systems that we're using. So it's not any um, surprise to you that we are facing a public health crisis. We're facing, of course, an associated economic crisis, uh, a civil rights crisis, certainly in the United States, but actually in many places around the world, as there is really a recognition of the deep inequalities that are surfaced at times like these and the need to correct those, and a climate crisis, which is related um, to uh, the ways in which uh, governments have behaved over you know, many, many years. Um, and I will certainly put the US government uh, at the top of that list in the last four years. One of the things about moments like these in history is that they often lead to major generational social change. And if you think back to, um, certainly if I use uh, the US history, to the 1870s in reconstruction, 1900s with the transformation from an agrarian to an urban society and the progressive education movement that John Dewey led that went along with that. In the 1930s, in the Great Depression, we not only had uh, the Social Security Administration and many other big social policies enacted, but we also had the Progressive Education Association transforming schools uh, around the country. In the 1960s, uh, education innovation went alongside civil rights activism and reforms in the 1990s. And here we are in 2020 on this 30 year cycle with these very big um, opportunities for progressive educational change. We do of course face these yawning equity chasms uh, that uh, threaten major segments of society and that focuses our attention as it must to the issues of equity and systemic racism and ways to correct uh, those long-standing challenges. We have the largest economic disparities since 1929. Uh, in fact, at this moment in history, the top 1% of wage earners in the United States controls about 50% of the, more wealth than 50% of the population. Uh, that's going to need uh, corrections so that everyone can earn a living wage uh, and be part of the economy. Uh, we have had inadequate action to address the health, safety, and economic effects of the pandemic. I will say um, there has been enormous innovation around the world, and we should think about that as we also think about how to mobilize governments to take advantage of what is being learned. Um, and though both of those things live side by side. I happen to read the Journal of the American Medicine Association, Medical Association, JAMA, and the New England Journal of Medicine on a regular basis. I get them every day and there are 10 articles a day about what we're learning about COVID-19, about treatments, about um, uh, variants of the virus, about how to deal with it, about public health. The explosion of knowledge has been just incredible and the sharing of that knowledge. And the same thing is true in education. And these are moments that really trigger a renaissance in the way people behave with one another, a collaboratively often rather than competitively uh, with uh, innovation and invention uh, in the moment. So this is a part of the context as well. And schools we know are one of the few safety nets in many hard hit communities, offering food, offering access to uh, digital devices and the internet, organizing social services for families that have been hard hit. This uh, photo is of two little girls who are sitting outside of Taco Bell in California, trying to get access to the internet, which has become one of the symbols of the great uh, inequalities in access to digital resources um, in our state and in many other places. And this Oakland student um, you know, told us uh, what I think many students are experiencing. Um, he said, I'm concerned about food, jobs, money, my education, racism towards Asian Pacific Islander folks is a big concern for us too. I miss being around my friends and I'm feeling really, really depressed, but I can't really tell my family. So young people are bringing 
a lot of trauma, uh, a lot of uh, anxiety uh, into their experience with schools and educators are responding with empathy, with strategies to support social and emotional learning and supports. Um, and this is really changing the way we think about the purposes of schools. So uh, Learning Policy Institute put out a report this last fall uh, on restarting and reinventing school. You can find it on uh, the Learning Policy Institute website. Um, and it talks about all the ways in which we should capture the innovations and the necessities that are going on now um, to reinvent school as we are really bringing students back to physical school over the coming months. Reinventing school means focusing on authentic learning and equity, harnessing the knowledge of human development learning and effective teaching that was accumulated over the last century and needed for the next. We are still in many places trying to break away from the system that was created in the early 1900s, the industrial mass education system that was put in place to put children on assembly lines that have been invented by Henry Ford um, in the auto industry to you know, uh, bureaucratize schools uh, as Max Weber, who was a theor theorist who kind of spoke to bureaucracies noted, bureaucracies are perfected to the extent that they are dehumanized. And the point was that we would govern by rules, not by individual proclivities. But that has created a way of doing school in so many countries uh, that is not adequate to the moments that we have before us today. So we do know some things from the sciences of learning and development. These have been captured in some recent syntheses of the knowledge base that are really important. And I think that have been pushed aside in some cases uh, through other policies that focus on you know, the mechanisms of schooling. First, of course, relationships are the essential ingredient that catalyzes healthy development and learning. In fact, in our brains, it is the relationships that parents have with their children, that children have with other uh, children and adults that actually build brain architecture. They cause um, the way in which people put things together and learn and develop neuron connections. Uh, the uh, hormones associated with that, the uh, oxytocin that is associated with getting a hug and feeling safe and protected is also associated with building brain architecture. And similarly, um, Difficult emotions uh, shut that architecture down. Children actively construct knowledge by connecting what they know to what they're learning within their cultural context. So we need to make those connections possible. As John Dewey said, we bring the child to the curriculum and the curriculum to the child. Uh, and that requires a way of knowing children deeply and connecting what we want them to learn to what they already experience and know. Learning is social, emotional, and academic. If you come into a classroom situation feeling good about the teacher, feeling trusted, uh, feeling um, excited about what there is to be learned, you learn more. And if you come into that setting with trauma, with anxiety, with other things that have happened, or with the view that you're going to be stigmatized and stereotyped in that setting, then your brain shuts down and you learn less. So social and emotional learning is not a frill. It is actually the pathway to academic learning. Students' perceptions of their own ability influence learning. So if schools see their charge as ranking and sorting, rating and grading, telling students and everyone else who's above, who's below uh, on a unidimensional idea about achievement, they're actually impeding the learning process for students who are ranked and sorted in that way. The thing we need for schools to of course be doing is supporting students and seeing their own learning strategies, strengths, assets, and building on those as well as their talents and interests. Uh, and we need the systems of schooling, the ways in which people structure such things as funding and assessment and curriculum to reinforce that view, the view of potential and development, rather than the view of ranking, sorting, and selecting. And of course, adversity affects learning. Effective schools have to be trauma-informed and healing-focused. And we know a great deal about how trauma um, actually undermines 
students learning process, but we also know that relationships um, that are strong and um, consistent uh, are also part of the healing process that allows resilience um, to occur. So this is a time, as this Atlanta parent put it, to reprioritize, to see if something can be different. As she put it, to reset the system, we have to take a loss, but we can recoup the loss if we actually get kids excited about education, create a more positive space for them to learn. Uh, this is the document I was talking about, restarting and reinventing schools, uh, really rooted in what we know about how children learn and develop. And in that document, we identify 10 different areas of change that are interlocking, uh, that uh, take us through the elements that will allow us as policymakers, as practitioners, uh, and as stakeholders in the system to use this opportunity to create the system that will be with us, hopefully for the next 100 years, uh, rather than trying to return to the normal that in many cases was not uh, good enough for all students. Uh, the first part of getting back to school, of course, is closing the digital divide. We've done a lot in many countries to do that. We need to take this the rest of the way so that it never reemerges again, so that the ability to be connected, uh, not only with your teachers and peers in your own local school district, but with uh, children and teachers around the world, as is often happening, where kids are doing projects with each other uh, across uh, global boundaries uh, and developing uh, a notion of globalism and unity in the world. Uh, that has to be part of what the instruction is when we go back to physical buildings, if we're not in them right now, and as we continue to build the system. That requires a set of policy changes as well as resource allocations. We need to strengthen blended learning in ways that allow students to engage interactively with each other uh, and with um, interactive materials that really help them learn. We've seen that there are ways that um, children can really learn more effectively in some cases with the combination, the right combination of teachers, peers, uh, and opportunities to connect with uh, ideas, research, other people, uh, and interact using these technology platforms. We need to build on that. We need to assess what students need, both socially and emotionally, and in their home contexts, uh, as well as academically, and really use that as the basis for figuring out what to do next. And then we need to transform the teaching and learning process. Uh, that includes, of course, ensuring supports for social emotional learning. One of the things I have really uh, been thrilled to see, certainly across California, but also across uh, the US and the world, is how schools are front uh, loading and uh, prioritizing the social and emotional learning elements that at one point in many places were pushed aside, we don't have time, uh, we now see that we must have time. We must have the opportunity to help kids think about their own uh, feelings, uh, share what they're experiencing, learn strategies for managing and coping, for interacting with each other, for taking social responsibility and engaging in the world, which gives them a sense of agency uh, and prepares them for the kind of civic engagement that we will need for them to have to turn this world around. So the uh, social and emotional learning integration uh, is happening. We need to continue that. Redesigning schools for stronger relationships, those factory model designs uh, that really minimize relationships, they were designed to do that, are changing as we figure out how we have to build smaller cohorts of children who stay with each other and with a teacher for a longer period of time so that they can be both um, safe from transmitting the virus or ready to quarantine if needed. But also we know from schools that have already redesigned that when they have these teams of teachers working with shared groups of students, when they have advisory systems that put them into close contact with adults over a period of time who can also relate to the families, when we put them into relationships that are sustained and continuous, they graduate at higher rates, they do better in school, they 
create stronger attachments, they have resources to help them uh, meet, meet all of the challenges that they're experiencing. So it is time now to uh, really redesign the structure of schools in the way that adults and children are brought together uh, for the work that they're doing. And then to do that while we're emphasizing authentic learning that's meaningful in the community, connected to children's experiences, that is culturally responsive, culturally affirming, culturally sustaining for them, so that we're really enabling them to uh, come into school in a way that will be successful, affirming, uh, and build those connections that I talked about earlier. I've seen so many schools that are doing amazing work. Uh, one school we recently just completed a study of is Humanitas Social Justice High School in Los Angeles, where uh, as COVID, uh, as they had to go into distance learning, uh, as the pandemic began in March, they were um, doing project-based learning already. They decided to study COVID in their community. Uh, and they studied exponential functions and how do you understand the curve and what's happening and how to bend the curve of, of uh, infection rates, uh, tracking it statistically in their community and math, uh, looking from a scientific perspective at the virus and the biology of these kinds of um, uh, pandemics, um, not only this one, but other ones, looking uh, from a history social science perspective at what was happening in the community, um, what was happening to jobs, to families, whose families are <clears throat> being uh, affected and how that was affecting the community, uh, writing about it, um, helping people in the community understand uh, what's going on as well, using their English language arts skills, um, doing all of that bilingually. So really taking a, an integrated approach to helping students use the experience um, to gain both academic skills and a sense of uh, agency in the moment. Uh, we see this kind of work you know, in so many schools and educators inventing and sharing those inventors' inventions. And then of course we need to prepare educators and engage educators in reinventing schools uh, as is beginning to happen in so many places across the country. I've noted the centrality of social emotional learning, which not only includes those areas of um, learning about particular skills, but also the growth mindset that allows people to be resilient, which is supported in schools when uh, teachers take a strategy of uh, providing the opportunity to engage in uh, serious work, getting feedback about that work, continuing to revise that work so that it is more and more um, expert uh, so that students always see that I can get better at what I'm doing and I have the opportunity to grow and to demonstrate that growth. And when we do that, we know we get greater achievement, graduation rates, improved college and career ready skills. We also have a moment where some people are responding with the old strategies. Let's test all the kids. Let's identify who's above, who's below, who's on grade level. Let's put them into different tracks and different groups. Uh, and then we'll remediate some and you know, kind of drill them on what they've missed and others will allow to move forward. Uh, some people have even said, let's hold back whole cohorts of children um, in school, we have a lot of evidence that uh, grade retention and remediation structured that way do not end up uh, producing higher achievement. They do produce more discouragement, more disengagement and higher dropout rates in the end. So we need to support educators to learn how to take advantage of the gains that can be made uh, as students learn in inquiry-based heterogeneous groups. And there are a number of strategies that um, are just examples of the many that are available to use cooperative learning in what's called complex instruction to uh, really enable students to accelerate their learning um, in this moment. Um, U-cubed is a math, uh, a math education strategy that has had enormous success with millions of children and um, thousands of teachers across the United States and in the world uh, that use some of those strategies and ways of teaching mathematics that are authentic 
and engaging and produce strong achievement gains, especially for students who have been furthest from opportunity. Expeditionary learning is another example in the English language arts. Uh, the point is that there are ways that we want to support building a community of learners who engage in serious inquiry together, using what we know about how people learn uh, to address what people worry about as the learning loss uh, of this moment. I wanna just note that children are always learning. Um, and even the studies that have been done quote on learning loss have said, kids are continuing to progress, but not always in the same rates on the traditional school curriculum. But meanwhile, they are learning things about how to take care of their families, how to survive in a context like this, how to be resilient, how to be resourceful. There are all kinds of things that we need to tap in the learning that children have undertaken. And then we need to support educators uh, as they learn about the ways to support all the areas of children's development, social, emotional, cognitive, how to create the kind of inquiry-based curriculum that supports the whole child's progress and develop the skills for trauma-informed and healing-oriented practice. And we know that teacher learning happens the same way that student learning happens. We need to create experiences uh, for teachers where they can see in practice uh, what it is that they are seeking to learn uh, for teachers who are in training and those who are also engaged in professional development. Uh, we need to allow teachers to get access to each other uh, so that they can share their expertise, uh, develop the relationships and professional communities of practice that enable change. Uh, and to do that, we need to rethink time and resources. We need to both provide expanded learning time for children and expanded learning time for teachers. Uh, we need to establish community schools or wraparound supports so that children are taken care of in every way. Uh, in the school environment, we've seen how community schools have really uh, been able to make sure that all children are getting what they need and families are connected to schools. Uh, these are not the schools that are losing access to kids. They're the schools that are making the connections even stronger. And then of course, we have to leverage adequate and equitable school funding in every country of the world and in every uh, community uh, within each country. And that's gonna be a major agenda over this coming decade. So I wanna close by just noting that there are a lot of innovations that are going on for us to build on as we rethink and reinvent schooling. We have new uses for technology for learning that have opened up all kinds of vistas. I think about in Long Beach, uh, California, where they realized that with technology, um, students could get access to teachers that they would not otherwise get to study with and teachers could see each other teach. So they opened up classes uh, and some of the master teachers in that district had 2000 kids attending uh, you know, a class and other teachers tuning in and then creating a community of those teachers to share strategies uh, for um, using technology for learning. Lots of ways in which we can uh, very purposefully benefit from what we've learned if we share it. New attention to social emotional learning and student welfare, we've got to keep that at the center. Uh, there are families now that are working one-on-one -on -one with educators um, including for students who are special education students now having their families engaged in knowing what helps them learn and helping enact that set of strategies. Uh, what a great gift that will be if we continue those ways of working. New approaches to assessment, which are focusing now on formative and diagnostic assessment. Uh, for the purpose of supporting learning rather than uh, focusing particularly on summative assessments for the purpose primarily of ranking and sorting children uh, or schools. New ways to group students and adults to be in strong relationship with each other. Uh, students have more time when they are also on their own, autonomously following up on their learning, doing their research, um, engaging with materials. Uh, it turns out that you don't have to babysit children every hour of the day, uh, particularly as they get older. 
um, to uh, enable them to learn. And that's also opened up new time for teacher collaboration. We have a lot of districts now where in the United States, um, if Monday and Tuesday are uh, days where kids are online and Thursday and Friday, they're in the building, Wednesday is a teacher development day and a day where teachers are working with one another. We found that eight hours of differential time for teachers that was missing in most American schools. And this is true in some other countries around the world. Uh, we need to keep it uh, along with the new pedagogies that are enabling this kind of growth and the new ways of collaborating that we are developing across classrooms and schools and even countries. So I know that this is a challenging time and it is out of these moments of challenge that we really see um, great changes occurring. And I'm reminded of the words of Robert Kennedy who noted that it is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time someone stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Uh, this is in fact what's happening among educators. Um, within and across countries right now. Uh, and we need to understand that each time we take a step uh, to dare to think differently about how to support our children, that ripple of hope has effects all across the world. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Darling Hammond, this was so overview and uh, giving us not just a global look, but a look inside of the, what the profession is doing, what the learners are doing, what they're saying, what the parents. Uh, it's a very, very complete picture. And I appreciate David's story and his introduction of why the people in Singapore were so uh, excited and so anxious to say, you, Dr. Darling Hammond, help them build really one of the premier public education systems on the planet. I wanna circle back on, on this a little point about that because I have had the great pleasure of watching a number of the interviews and postings in Edutopia. Uh, you were one of the participants in that amazing uh, ongoing look at where is education going? What can we be doing, et cetera? But uh, one that was um, caught my eye was this question of international competitiveness, partly because Global Minnesota is always thinking about connecting Minnesotans to the world and the world to Minnesota. That's how we operate. And you made the point that um, consistently we've been way down the ranks in terms of how our education system prepares us, all of us, for this global economy. A lot of different things in that global economy, but some of them have to do with language and communication. Some of them have to do with relationships. Some of them have to do with skills in particular types of technology or particular types of ways of thinking. But you, um, you spoke in that uh, uh, Edutopia event about things that we could do that would move us up and make us more engaged and more successful in the international economy, in the international community. And it seems like that's part of building back better. Is there some guidance or ideas or some things to point to that could get us moving forward on that international side of preparing all of us, including our younger learners, for that future economy, <clears throat> not for the one that's been easily decimated by this pandemic. Yeah. Well, there's so many things to think about there. One is, of course, we want to be part of the international community, which we haven't been over the last four years, and we need to re-enter the international community. Uh, and you know, that was something that um, when the Obama administration came in, had to be done as well. And we re-engaged with OECD and we re-engaged with the countries that were holding summits together to say, how do we understand education? And we began to be able to learn from other countries what their strategies are. And that's of course, critically important. Um, there are a couple of things that we can learn from others. Uh, and of course we need to act on now. And uh, there is a real uh, 
strong, as I mentioned, a really strong equity agenda in the Biden administration. But one of the things that we do differently than other high achieving countries is we fund education so unequally. And we have such a tattered safety net for children. So we have the highest poverty rate of children in the industrialized world by a very large margin. Uh, and uh, we don't have universal health care. We don't have the support systems for children and families to ensure the kids are well taken care of, uh, both in schools and out of schools. Our funding systems for education are very unequal. We spend three times more in the wealthiest state than we do in the uh, lowest funded state. In the within states, we spend three times more in the highest funded districts than in the lowest funded districts. That's got to end. That is you know, an antiquated notion of how to structure an education system that um, really holds us back. If you look at the um, data from things like the PISA tests, uh, and if you look at um, schools in which, in the United States, in which fewer than 10% of children live in poverty, which is more analogous to others in the world, we rank number one in reading. Uh, and if you even look in schools where fewer than 25% of kids live in poverty, we're number three in reading in the world. Um, and that's way more kids in poverty than any of the other industrialized countries have. Uh, we have almost one in four kids living in poverty, growing homelessness, all the rest of the, you know, strat you know the, the challenges that um, kids experience. Uh, the, where we fall down is the growing number of schools that are high poverty, concentrated, high poverty, segregated, typically um, more than 90% African-American and Latinx students, which are under-resourced. Uh, and those schools, you know, do much less well because they don't have the resources that they need to deal with the um, uh, needs that the children have. Uh, we don't have universal pre-K, uh, all of these things. So one of the things we can learn from other countries is how to organize our system so it is truly equitable, so that it has the on-ramp that's needed. And I hope in these next few years, we'll also see ways to wrap around um, children with healthcare for all, with universal pre-K as part of the Biden agenda with uh, changes in school funding systems so that there is in fact the opportunity to learn from not only the great teaching that goes on in the United States against the odds, uh, but also the efforts of other countries. Well, it feels like that concept of the wraparound is that, that larger picture, the, both the individual attention to learners and the kind of universal attention, the wraparound, love, attention, all of the elements of a society taking care of each other, families taking care of each other and in, in all of this. It seems like you have a message that's a message that's um, uh, for the whole society to take into their hearts, into their minds, into their souls in terms of how are we um, being responsible, sustainable, resilient? How are we being loving, a loving community, a blessed community? Uh, in your the couple minutes that we still have left after you've been giving us this incredible global picture, what's your one piece of advice for the, I don't know, maybe a couple thousand people watching from all over the planet about uh, you know how we get ourselves up the next day and keep moving, moving things forward in the right direction. Well, there's never only one thing, right? <laughs> because we have exactly. to think about how everything relates to everything else. Um, but you know, I think I take hope and inspiration from the um, people I work with, from the educators I work with, who are. Uh, you know, just extraordinary people uh, who see this, who are in this work, not for the salary, you know, because <laughs> if that were the case, they didn't, you know, look ahead at the salary schedule. They're, they're here because they care about uh, other people, about building the next generation, about wrapping around children, giving them what they need. And um, I think when we have governments, as we sometimes do, 
in different countries around the world, and I think we're about to have one in the United States, uh, that really also have that frame of reference. It's a time for educators to speak up and to be both politically active and educationally active uh, about what's needed, what works, how do we do it, um, to really help those who are in the policy community understand uh, as many, want, many of them want to make the right kinds of changes, what it will take to do that. The other thing is that whenever we undertake major changes in societies and, and do reforms of education, and many of us have been through eras of reform, you know, there's always the possibility for a good idea to go bad. That, you know, we have an idea and then somebody, you know, um, mandates it and People who receive it don't necessarily understand it or don't have the resources to do it. And then some pale shadow of what we had hoped would happen happens. So one of the things that's gonna be so important for members of the education community is to share their knowledge with each other, to share their expertise with each other. If you've you know, been one of those people who's helped to start a community school that is succeeding in wrapping around the children and really enabling them to succeed, Think about all the ways that you can help others who are gonna start that process. Learn what it is that you have had the opportunity to learn uh, as you've innovated in the classroom and pedagogy. Uh, how do we build the collaborative capacity of everyone in the profession to share what they're learning and uh, help others take those next steps? I think that's gonna be just critically important. Well, it's inspiring for me to hear and to think about this. And it uh, also makes me think uh, some about my mother, who was a teacher at a very young age. And I was born and that, among other things, disrupted that post-World War II teaching. Um, but later on, she went back to college when I did. And we graduated the same day. Oh. He went on to be an elementary teacher, and I was not very successful in being a high school social studies teacher. But when she later in life went back to school again and became a principal, she said, I want to do the best job possible. But when I retire, I want to be out helping those student teachers that are learning, that are in placed in schools in that last. And I had remembered that scary first day of my placement. Yeah. And what I realized is that there's something about true teachers, people with the teacher's heart that is in it to share and to learn forever and to share and to be part of that, making things better for all. Yeah. And you today have given us an incredible example of what that looks like from a very thoughtful point of view. And you've inspired us to think about how we can be part of wrapping around, of speaking up, of sharing successes, of not being afraid of saying, you know, that might have been good then, but now things have changed or it didn't quite work out. But what I'm grateful for is that both your work in the transition and your leadership right now with the California School Board, you're in the trenches making change happen. I feel like the future will be brighter and now we have the kind of support from a higher level in government, but it's gonna take the knitting together of ideas and people like you've been doing, whether it's to folks in Singapore or folks in Oakland or folks right here in Minnesota and around the world. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you for making all those Edutopia tapes. People should go watch those. <laughs> and I look forward to our next opportunity to together keep making a brighter future for our learners, for the educators, and for all of us as we go into this next period where we have an opportunity to actually build back better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. Thank Take you. care.